Now, Tory MPs have criticised Gary Lineker. They've said that he can be a politician or he can be a public broadcaster, but he can't be both. And that comes ahead of an award that he's going to be given by Amnesty International tomorrow for his activism. And presumably that's based on his tweets. And it follows a critical tweet that he wrote about the government's migration policy. And as you might remember, a couple of months ago, that saw him suspended for a while from presenting Match of the Day. But he is coming back to speak about sitting on a fortune. It's his ITV quiz show, and he's here on Good Morning Britain this morning, and it's great to see you, Gary Lineker. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Good. Well, let's start with the, uh, the fact that you're doing sitting on a fortune. Are you sitting on a fortune, Gary, right now? <laughs> are you sitting comfortably? Um, I'm sitting on a well, quite comfy chair, so, um, <laughs> but um, which is not what sitting on a fortune is. It's actually quite uncomfortable that chair, um, puts a lot of pressure on them, but they um, they can win and do win uh, big money, so it's great. Tell us, right? It's a big uh, prime time weekend ITV show. What it's already had, obviously, a successful run, which is why it's coming back. What is the premise of sitting on a fortune? Why why is it such a success? I think it's. Um, I think it was so popular because um, because there's so much drama guaranteed in each show, and, and you generally finish on a high moment because of the nature of it and the fact that normally one of the six contestants will win a lot of money, um, pretty much guaranteed, really. Although it still can go wrong, so there's always that jeopardy. But it's really exciting at the end uh, when someone's sitting in the money chair at the right time. Well, so talking of uh, jeopardy and drama, Gary, as presenter of Match of the Day, can we talk about the Premier League this season? Firstly, Man City winning, Arsenal looking like they could have won for such a long period of time uh, and then just sort of almost giving it away. What happened there? Is that about sitting on a fortune and having a lot of money, in Man City's case? Well, obviously, that helps massively, and obviously, they're under investigation as well, but we'll have to see what those, um, those charges amount to. But um, they're a fabulous football team. I mean, Arsenal, yes, they faded uh, towards the end, and I just think that perhaps the strength in depth of Manchester City opposed perhaps to Arsenal at present, and they had one or two key injuries in, in the last few weeks, uh, particularly, I think, Saliba, who they missed massively and started giving away a few goals. But, um, you know... Whatever you think about Manchester City and their money, they are a, a wonderful football team. They've been pretty dominant in our league for, for a while now. I, I, you know, people are a bit worried that that's going to go on forever. I, I suspect yeah. when Pep Guardiola goes, um, it'll be very difficult for them to, to continue that, that success. Um, but they're a hell of a football team. And let's look then at the other end of the table, because obviously viewers remember 2016... Do we have to? Yes, please. <laughs> look, you had this wonderful okay. moment, Leicester, 2016, <laughs> winning the Premier League. We all had the wonderful moment of seeing you in your boxes, in your boxes? On, uh, on Match of the Day. How have Leicester got themselves into a position where they could, and unfortunately looks likely that, they might be relegated? Um, well, I think probably we should perhaps look at the, the, the... It's more surprising that they won the league in 2016. I think it, it really highlights what an absolute sporting team miracle that was, uh, Leicester winning the league. I think what's really happened, Susanna, is we've just returned to being Leicester City again, which is, has always been a kind of uh, team f flicking between the top two leagues. Um, the odd, you know, successful season, but uh, what we've had in the last few years, uh, whether we go down or not um, at the weekend, has, uh, has been absolutely remarkable. To win the league for the first time in the history, to then win the FA Cup in the first time in the history. It's been a magical little run. I, I, I wish it could have gone on forever, um, but um, it it wasn't to be. Um, and now it's, it's a big... Big well, question mark over whether we'll stay in the, in, in the top flight. But fingers crossed, you never know. Exactly. That's football, isn't it? That's football. Well, look, um, let's spin the clock back a bit. Um, 
I was on Question Time two or three months ago in the week that you were suspended from, uh, from Match of the Day and actually found myself defending you um, because you came in for an awful lot of criticism uh, for your comments about Britain's immigration policy. Um, and my view was that because you're not a political reporter or presenter, you're not on Panorama as it used to be or Newsnight, uh, I couldn't see any problem uh, with, a, with a sports presenter having his own private Twitter account and saying pretty much what he likes within the law. But what I did do, I disagreed with what you'd actually said, which was essentially to compare the British government today in 2023 uh, to the Nazi government, um, the dictatorship in the early 1930s, as you, as you spoke about Britain's immigration policy. Looking back, I mean, we all say things that we change our minds about. Looking back, do you think that was a fair comparison? Um, well, or, or, already you've misrepresented what I said, and that's that's what happened because of the Daily Mail headline, which um, caused this furore in the first place. Um, I didn't compare the Nazi um, the government to the Nazis. I didn't talk about the Holocaust. I didn't do any of that. All I said was some of the language is not dissimilar to that used. Um, back in the 30s in Germany, and there is a substantial um, <laughs> difference in that. Um, but it's, it's amazing how many people do think that because, obviously, they see the front page of a head, front page headline in a newspaper. But that's water under the bridge now. All's well with the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a very disproportionate story, and it was all very... Um, it, or very kind of bonkers it for for a while, but um, well, it got you in taken the off end, air. Uh, common sense prevailed. Well, it got you taken off air. Um, uh, could, could, all right, then. I, I'm sorry if you think it's water under the bridge, and it is, of course. Um, but let's just paddle in it a little bit longer, if you don't mind. Um, let's just take what you did say then. What was similar uh, about the way that the Nazis spoke about race and immigration, and the way that the British government talks about race and immigration? What what, what are the similarities that you allege? Uh, Again, you're using the term uh, about Nazis and, and trying to connect with... Well, it was a Nazi um, government, Gary. Government. Sorry, uh, Gary, uh, if, if you talk about the German government in the early 1930s, um, you may not use the word Nazi, and I actually said that for, on your behalf on, on, on Question Time, but it was a Nazi government. You, you, can't, you can't pretend that it wasn't. It was. I was talking about some of the language that is not dissimilar, and, and, and that is very much the case. You know, we use the word swarm, we use the word invasion, we use the word rapists, all these for, for the, you know, people, um, you know, fleeing persecution, fleeing war, all, awful circumstances. All I was trying to say is we, we can use kinder language. And well, it was coming nothing up to more the, okay, or nothing less than that, Richard. All right, well, let's step out of those, those shallows then and come up to the present. Um, what would you like to say? You've got, you've got the opportunity, you don't have to say anything, but what would you like to say to these Tory MPs uh, who, once again, I disagree with, uh, who say that you can be a politician or a public broadcaster, but you can't be both? Why can't you be both? Um... Well, I think I can, and I, I am, and I think it's really important um, to, if you've got a big platform to try and use it for what you think um, is is for the good, um, and and that's what I've always done, and, and that's what I'll continue to do. But people are entitled to their opinions, um, MPs, um, we all are, and um, and I think you know some of these people that perhaps complain about certain things are also. Um, the, the massive campaigners for freedom of speech. So, you know, you can't have it always. Um, but they're perfectly entitled to their opinion. I, I don't, you know, I'm absolutely happy with that. And do you think there's a contradiction in working for the BBC and being paid for by the BBC, which is obviously paid for by us, and making these, these political statements? Do you, do you see that as a conflict? I mean, supposing you, you work for ITV rather than the BBC? Well, I'm not in news and current affairs. Um, I, I think if you, you know, if you're a staff, a proper employer to a place. Whereas obviously I'm a freelance. I'm doing. A, I'm here to promote a show. I'm sitting on a fortune, which is an ITV show. So, you know, I'm on all sorts of platforms. Um, so I think we're okay. I've got, no, I've, you know, we're, I think this has been trying to, you know, and you're doing it a little bit now. It's trying to take things out of proportion. Um, it was, it was a silly story that was kind of blown up because I was misrepresented. Um, but, you know, I think it got resolved in the end and um, we'll, uh, we'll carry on for the time being. Yeah. Um, Gary, you're going to get a Sport and Human Rights Award at a ceremony mm. in Rome uh, tomorrow. Uh, I hope you know that, because otherwise I've, uh, <laughs> that, I should have Spoiler done a spoiler surprise. alert on that. <laughs> um, but you definitely have won yeah. that, yeah, because you're a staunch advocate, in their words, for the rights of refugees and migrants. Um, that's the Amnesty International release. Of course, um, you know, we mustn't forget, you. when people say... 
Well, why don't you take a refugee in yourself? You have taken in not just one refugee, but two refugees. Um, and one of them, Rashid Baluk, lived with you for weeks, thanked you for being a caring and loving defender of humanity. And he's a law student. Mm. And, um, and then uh, the, I think you, you also um, hosted a second refugee, a young Turk, a Turkish man who's now at university. Yeah. Do you... What is it, do you think, that hosting a, a refugee helps you to understand and you wish other people could understand about the refugee experience? Um, I think it was um, it, it was a wonderful experience, actually, and yeah. um, and I, I think particularly for my boys, um, you know, they're young men growing up, and they met them and they told their stories, and it gave them the real perspective in life of perhaps how fortunate they are, and, and we are. We, you know, imagine the circumstances where you have to leave your home because you know you're being bombed or you're being persecuted or there's some awful situation. Imagine what it would take for you actually to flee whatever you've got on your back at the time. Um, so I think, you know, obviously I house them because originally all I used to get if I ever tweeted pro-refugee um, tweets or something was, was people going, well, why don't you have them in your house, Gary? Which I, I, I don't quite know why they say that, because obviously they're not going to live in their house, so it's not necessarily a worry. But then one day I saw this charity um, called Refugees at Home, and um, so I got in touch and then went through the process and, and housed a couple, and it was a brilliant experience. And, um, you know, people are people. You know, we talk about, you know, the, the boat, stop the boats and that, but they're actually people in those boats and they're human beings. And, and by the massive percentage of them are here for, you know, genuine purposes. Um, obviously, we can't have everyone, we know that. Um, but it's, but we, you know, we need to take our fair share and we need to be kind and, and show some compassion and some empathy. Mm. Well, can I just ask you about, about your tweets, Gary, which partly, I, I guess, is one of the reasons you're getting this award tom tomorrow. What motivates you? Because you are a prolific tweeter. Um, you, you tweet virtually every day about a huge range of subjects. What, what's your motivation? Um, well, I don't tweet about a huge range of subjects. Um, I, I, my motivation is I quite enjoy it. Um, it's, you know, I like writing, always have done, and um, it's... Um, I think it's a lot of fun, it's engaging. Obviously, there are a few downsides occasionally. Um, I've managed to get a, a very large platform, which I, I try to use for what I, I think is good. Um, I, I like tweeting, Richard. It's, it's, quite, it's quite fun. I enjoy Twitter. Well, it's the definition of free speech, isn't it? And that's kind of what, what we're here for. Um, all right, Gary, it's great to talk to you. Congratulations on the series. Enjoy Rome. And uh, looking forward to your next tweet. Thank you. <laughs> and good luck to Leicester. Thank you. But you probably like to use your platform. <laughs> we need it. To say that, yeah. <laughs>